Now, the latest from ITV News in the West Country with Kylie Pentelo and John T. Messer. Hello and welcome to Thursday's programme. Coming up tonight, between now and half past six. Joy for protesters after plans for a new agricultural centre at Lost Withiel are refused. We value our heritage, we value our environment and we value our, our thriving business centre and our sense of community. And I really hope today you've seen, you know, what a sense of community we have. Also ahead, a new play tells the story of Jewish refugee children fleeing the Holocaust to the East Devon village of Tallerton. They just thought they would have us for about six months or so. And then it landed up for, you know, years. It's quite something for them to do it, you know. Plus how one of Dorset's best known landmarks is crumbling into the sea. With promotion on the line, our Devon clubs prepare for a strong finish to the season. And a good chunk of the Easter weekend looks like it will be pretty fine and pretty warm. We just might not see all that much sunshine around. I'll bring you all the forecast details at the end of the programme. Good evening. Eden Project founder Sir Tim Smith's plan for a new horticultural and agricultural centre in Los Withiel has been refused by Cornwall Council. This morning, protesters gathered outside New County Hall in Truro to voice their concerns about the designs for Gillyflower Farm, claiming the facilities would harm both the environment and local community. Sam Blackledge is in Truro for us this evening. So Sam, was this outcome a surprise then? Well, it was a bit of a surprise, John T. Yes, the morning, the morning started, as you say, with a group of protesters outside County Hall with their guitars and their placards intent on making a bit of noise and a bit of a nuisance of themselves. But they told me they were expecting this application to just be waved through. It was submitted, as you say, by Sir Tim Smith, founder of the Eden Project and the Lost Gardens of Heligan. This was supposed to be his third big Cornish project. It was referred to as his legacy. But as you'll see, the planning meeting today didn't quite go his way. The song these musical protesters are singing was specially written for today's gathering. Early this morning the entrance to County Hall hosted an impromptu concert but among the tunes, there was a serious point being made. They were urging councillors to dismiss the latest idea from the founder of the Eden Project and the Lost Gardens of Heligan. This is how it might look. A disused golf course just outside Los Withiel could be transformed into an education centre for horticulture, agronomy and cookery. The plan includes 19 holiday lodges, a cafe, an orchard and facilities for cooking and studying but it's not everyone's cup of tea. It's not going to help our town, it's going to hollow it out. We need more inward investment into our communities, not out of town developments. More bricks and mortar tourist attractions don't help. It's greenwashing, it's nothing to do with agronomy or cookery or anything else. It's about 20 or 19 holiday homes. Our heritage needs to be preserved. Sir Tim told the planning meeting he's not motivated by profit, but by his passion for horticulture, sustainability and boosting the local economy. After more than two hours of debate, the plan was rejected and he left without speaking to the waiting media as campaigners celebrated their victory. Total relief. We've really felt this has been stacked against us all the way through. Uh, the, the power and the kind of political influence this particular developer has um, and particularly in kind of getting his narrative across. And I really hope today you've seen what a sense of community we have. Sir Tim does now have the right to appeal, so we may well be seeing these images again before too long. Sam Blackledge, ITV News, in Truro. Elsewhere in the region today, a man from Devon has been jailed after kicking a pregnant woman in the abdomen and causing her unborn baby to die. Roger Bygrave from Townstall Road in Dartmouth had been drinking since lunchtime before attacking Alison Bolton outside a pub. 
the 38-year-old admitted causing grievous bodily harm and has been sentenced to two and a half years. Patients across our region are waiting up to three years for routine operations. Hospital trusts in Plymouth, Torbay, South Devon and Dorset had the worst records. That's according to new figures from a Freedom of Information request. Father and son have been praised after rescuing a dog from a cave on the Lizard Peninsula. Rudy Donovan and his dad jumped in to help after RNLI lifeboats had to stand down. The dog is now recovering at the vets. Now, a professor from Devon is researching the causes of sudden unexplained death in childhood. It usually occurs in children aged between one and five and is estimated to claim the lives of up to two children every fortnight. Well, families who've lost a child suddenly without medical explanation have been calling for more awareness of the tragedy. Amrit Birdie has been speaking to some of those who've been affected. In May 2019, three-year-old Frankie Grogan was put to bed by his mum as usual. The next morning, he was found unresponsive. Despite efforts to save him, he had died, without explanation, in his sleep. No parent should put their, their child to bed, you know, and, and their child not wake up in the morning. It's going to be a lifelong journey of, you know, trying to um, come to terms with the fact that he's not here anymore. Um, and to be sort of thrown into this world, you know, um, in such a shocking way you know it's it's taking you know a long long time and it will probably take forever you know you know we'll miss him forever sarah is now mum to five month old gracie and she's determined to share frankie's story to help other families with the awareness becomes um raising the money and then the research can take place you know and and with the research hopefully in time you know it won't exist but um obviously it's too late for Frankie, but um, hopefully, you know, people hearing Frankie's story will help him to have a positive impact on, on the future. Sudden unexplained death in childhood affects children over the age of one. It's not as well known as sudden infant death syndrome, also known as SIDS, which affects babies up to 12 months old. Professor Peter Fleming is a paediatrician and leading academic on SUDC from Devon. We know that putting the baby on the front for young babies increases the risk of that baby dying as a cot death by about tenfold. Exposure to tobacco smoke makes a huge difference, about, again, a four or five times increased risk by exposure to tobacco smoke. Neither of those factors are of any importance at all in sudden unexpected and unexplained death in childhood. The number of deaths caused by SIDS has dropped significantly after decades of research into it. However, SUDC was only recognised as a category of death a few years ago. This, among other reasons, makes research into it difficult. I think it's important to know that SUDC is really a category of death, of deaths that elude our understanding scientifically. Um, and it's probably a heterogeneous group, meaning the underlying causes to the children's deaths are probably not all of the same. We're probably dealing with a group of different entities. And so that's one of the real major challenges with researching SUDC. Nikki Speed co-founded charity SUDC UK after losing her daughter Rosie in 2013. There is such potential if we begin to talk about these deaths and learn from them and appropriately fund research. There is such potential to save lives. For anybody that has been affected by the sudden death of a child, we want them to know they are not alone. We are here in support and we also want them to know that we have hope for the future. Until the risk factors and underlying causes of SUDC are discovered, parents affected by this tragedy say they will live their lives trying to explain the unexplainable. Amrit Birdie, ITV News. And the ITV News continues with the national and international stories at 6.30. Lucrezia Mellorini has the details. Coming up, asylum seekers to be given one-way tickets to Rwanda. The Prime Minister announced some migrants will be sent 4,000 miles away. But Labour says it's all a distraction from the Partygate scandal and the plans simply won't work. Also, long queues at airports, railway stations and on the roads ahead of this weekend. We'll get the latest on the Great Easter getaway. And Prince Charles takes the Queen's place at the Royal Maundy service as it's announced she'll miss another traditional event this Sunday. Join me for those stories and more at 6.30.
for now, there's still the two of us here in the West Country. There's still plenty more to come on our programme this evening, including a cow horsing around near Taunton and a horse on Dartmoor who loves milk. That isn't enough to keep watching. We've also got Charlie at the Met Office for us and lots of people out there will be hanging on your every word, Charlie. Looking forward to this Easter weekend. I know it looks fairly decent with a lot of warmth around, but there's this little pool of cool air out towards the west. Find out if that makes it to us before the end of the weekend in a few minutes time. But before that, a new play is being staged in East Devon, telling the story of Jewish refugee children who were rehomed in the village of Talaton to escape the Holocaust as part of the Second World War Kinder Transport Scheme. More than 80 years have passed since the traumatic upheaval which brought the children to foster homes here in the West Country. But it's a story which has echoes in the current crisis facing families fleeing the war in Ukraine, as Bob Kreese now reports. We've been through so much together and the events that will unfold in this, our story, will show you how we became so close. The play they're rehearsing is a true story about the kinder transport children, Jewish refugees who were sheltered here during the Second World War. Tarleton provided a sanctuary for those fleeing the persecutions and the pogroms of Europe. Where possible, I've used words that were actually spoken or words that were written um, or letters that were written by the children. Um, all of these archives are retained by the families and they shared them with me. It's a great responsibility actually because you've got to make sure that what you write is true. 200 boys and girls wave a greeting to England. Thousands of predominantly Jewish children were brought to the UK from Nazi-controlled territory just before the war broke out. In many cases, they were the only members of their families who survived the Holocaust. The play tells the story of those who were brought here to Tallerton, a village not far from Exeter, where foster families opened their doors and brought them up as their own. We will take the parts of the Fraudenreich sisters. I will portray Paula. I was nine years old when we came to this country and I couldn't speak any English. And I will take on the role of Hedvig. Barely eight and nine years old, they left behind parents, four siblings, and they were completely wiped out. They were the only two members of their family to survive because they just happened to have been the right age and their parents were brave enough to put them on that train and wave them off. It is a, a very relevant story, particularly in the current times with the Ukraine crisis. It really speaks of the catastrophe that's going on then and now. But I think it's very important to keep this alive. And I think what's so lovely is that it's a local story. It's a positive story of redemption. And to remind everybody that, you know, that's one of the things that we as humans do really, really well is caring for other people. And uh, yeah, if we can all take that lesson and learn it, that's be really fantastic for us all. Issa Schneider was one of those kinder transport children. Now 92 years old and a great grandmother, Isabella Weber lives in Ivybridge. She says she'll never forget the kindness shown to her by the Gliddens who took her in. For me personally, it gave me security. Because originally, of course, I came out of Germany into Poland. And uh, then from Poland over here, you know, and it was sort of a roller coaster. So, you know, it was um, security. They were just country folk. I mean, they hardworking, you know, they didn't have much money. Really, the kindness and the love of their hearts to do it, to take in somebody else's children, not being able to speak English either. So that's, um, that was quite a big thing for them to take on. For us, I think they just thought they would have us for about six months or so. And then it landed up for, you know, years. And whether people are thinking about that, you know, now, with taking in refugees, I mean, it's, it's quite something for them to do it, you know. She will be coming to see the play at the end of the month, along with two other surviving members of that group, Gert and Manfred Korman, who are travelling over from America, where they eventually settled. Other relatives are coming from Israel. A total of 60 people connected with those original kinder transport children have been invited to a special reception here, as their remarkable story is told on stage. Bob Cruz, ITV News, Tallerton. Truly, it's remarkable, isn't it? I'd never heard of that no, before. Yeah, absolutely no. amazing.
Now, around uh, two thirds of adults are classified as overweight or obese, and the NHS spends billions of pounds on obesity related ill health. Now, a new weight loss drug is being made available on the NHS a little later this year, hailed by some as a game changer. But is this really the solution? And this evening's Tonight programme has been investigating. Kevin Ashford reports. Five years ago, Alex suffered a collapsed lung. He was unable to exercise and quickly began to gain weight. Through online research, he found out about a drug called semaglutide and got a private prescription. Combined with a strict exercise and nutrition plan, Alex says the drug played a big part in his four-stone weight loss. I would credit the vast majority of my success to the drug. That's not to take away from my achievements in having changed my lifestyle. If I had not discovered this medication, I could honestly say to you that, you know, it's a possibility that I wouldn't be here today, that my daughter wouldn't have her father and my, my wife wouldn't have her husband. That's, that's how big a difference it made to my life. The new drug, branded Wigovi, which is set to become available on the NHS, is a higher dose version of the one Alex took. Semeglutide works by creating the hormone that we all feel after you've eaten a meal, so that feeling of fullness. So essentially when someone's on this medication, they will have that feeling when eating, so they'll stop eating sooner. But equally in between meals, they'll feel that so that they don't crave the need to eat food in between meals as well. Most GPs won't be able to prescribe the new drug, which is administered by injection. Patients will need to be referred to one of the country's few specialist weight management centres. NICE recommends that only obese adults with a body mass index of at least 35 and one weight-related health condition can qualify for the new drug. NICE also told the Tonight programme that final guidance on Wagovi will be published at the end of next month. Kevin Ashford, ITV News. Now, one of the best-known coastal landmarks in Dorset needs £3 million of improvement works to stop it crumbling into the sea. The Cobb at Lyme Regis is walked on by millions of visitors every year. And Richard Lawrence is there for us this evening. So, Richard, just take us through how bad the damage is there, then. Well, you'd stand here and think this is one of the most solid structures in the entire southwest. The buildings, for example, have been standing there since 1723. But the real concern is just over the other side, where the harbour wall has taken a severe battering in recent years from the storms. Lots of temporary repairs that we were able to see at low tide early this morning. But now a much longer lasting solution is sought. And all those storms come at a hefty price. Three and a half million pounds is what the council estimates needs to be spent. The Cobb is the structure that defines Lyme Regis, protecting the harbour and town for centuries, but increasingly bearing the scars from its battles with Mother Nature. While the outer harbour wall stands fast, its businesses like the aquarium on the fish key that can bear the brunt. The wall has deteriorated rapidly over the last maybe 20 years. Obviously the storms seem to get worse every year. Um, you know, it needs to be done. You know, the waves come right over the top of the building sometimes. You know, we've just recently had scaffolding up um, for the, you know, that last storm. Loads of tiles off the roof. It's quite dangerous out here. As solid as it may appear, its deterioration has not gone unnoticed by residents and visitors. We've lived here years, so to see it improved would be amazing. You know, the kids, they do their um, junior fishing league down here. Um, so, but yeah. In the last 10 years, I suppose, there's much more fishing, commercial fishing going on. So this is not a very good environment for um, those guys to work on. This is not a very safe surface. The bulk of the project will focus on the inner harbour wall here. If we look at what's happening already, where we've tried to do some repair work over the past few years, um, that is now starting to erode itself. And it's taken out big chunks, really, hasn't it? Yes, it has and you can see that there's been various modifications done to the wall. Well, this is, uh, this, this is the solution for the long term. The council is now hoping for approval for the funding next month from the Environment Agency. We don't want to do anything that's going to reduce the character of the area. We just need to make it safe for people to uh, be here and obviously protect the businesses um, that uh, uh, will go down if we don't protect that wall. 
Dorset Council is hoping to carry out the work over winter next year once designs have been approved. But mindful that it is just one small project along a constantly changing coastline where millions more will need to be spent over the next few decades. Richard Lawrence, ITV News, Lyme Regis. Now we are in, uh, nearing the end of the football season and the region's two largest clubs are both in the hunt for promotion. Yeah, Plymouth Argyle are looking to get into the championship, whereas Exeter City are hoping to make it to League One. So an exciting and a nail-biting time for both sets of fans. Jackie Bird reports now on the club's promotion hopes. There's a bit of excitement in the air at St James's Park today and for someone who's been a fan for more than 53 years, it's a feeling like no other. Big Cole keeps the big bank clean and tidy, works on the turnstiles and is irreplaceable at Exeter City. He has a good feeling about the way the season is going. Oh, d definite promotion. Yeah, I've had a feeling since Christmas that everything seems to be coming together. You know, the players are smiling, the staff are happy, the ground's looking spanking. You know, everything seems to be you know, coming together. So it's Colchester at home tomorrow and then Tranmere away on Monday. They may be second in the table at the moment, but the boss is still keeping it calm. Well, the hardest thing is, is getting that extra step and getting that little bit further, which is what we want to achieve from, from now until the end of the season. Um, and we know that fans will play their part in that. And we're looking forward to playing in front of a big house. They'll have the biggest crowd here probably since the last time they played Plymouth Argyle, which was in 2019. And down the A38, they're also getting ready for a big weekend. They may be away at Wickham tomorrow, but Home Park is where all the fans want to be. The game on Monday against Sunderland is a sellout. This was the queue on Tuesday for tickets for the final game of the season. Our girl are massive everywhere we go. Everywhere we go. That sums it up, doesn't it? The thought of promotion is a bit closer for the Green Army with only four games to go, but manager of the month Stephen Schumacher isn't getting carried away. And yet yeah, they're enjoying it, it's so exciting. The Easter period's going to be brilliant, we're playing two teams uh, in the promotion hunt as well, and then after the Easter period you've got two teams who are going for automatic, so probably going to be full houses in all the stadiums that we go to, but these are the games that you want to be involved in as a player and as a manager, and we're looking forward to it. And this is how important it is to the fans. Only 15 minutes after tickets have gone on sale, already two and a half thousand have been sold. Guaranteed a sellout for the last game of the season. Jackie Bird, ITV News, Plymouth Argyle. <laughs> that one was very excited. Yeah. Uh, Jonty wanted me to describe this as moose in brief now, but um, it is I, won't, in brief. I won't be doing that. <laughs> um, but how about this? A rogue cow had to be pulled over by police after it was found walking along a road near Taunton. Police were called to the A358 in Somerset after receiving multiple reports from worried motorists. The force was able to move the cow to safety. <laughs> yeah, they didn't put it under arrest. Oh dear. No? Now, an extremely rare foal has been born on the edge of Dartmoor. Bertie is a Suffolk punch, critically endangered breed that has been at risk of dying out. Uh, Mother Bee was quite overdue when she gave birth at Lower Team Barn near Bobby Tracy, which led to some sleepless nights for breeder Tamsin Russell. We got to the yard within four and a half minutes from looking at those cameras. Um, it was just the most magical thing in the world. I think there wasn't, a, there wasn't really a dry eye when we realised that she was okay, he was okay, when he was suckling. And um, when we put them out two and a half days later and they trotted up through the field, it was magical to let my mare and my newborn foal, you know, trot off into their paddock. Oh, how cute is Bertie? Very cute, mm. yeah. Uh, it's time for the weather forecast now. We're all thinking about this, aren't we? Because we're heading into the long Easter weekend. Mm. Um, Charlie's at the Met Office. And, I mean, we've been chatting about this for a couple of days, haven't we, Charlie? But how's, how is it looking now? When, now it's upon us. Now it's tomorrow. It is looking uh, It's looking pretty decent, really, thankfully. Although there's been a lot of uncertainty and a lot of details to pin down, mostly it's going to be pretty fine. Uh, some contrast though, and I'll talk you through these. I'll transport you first to Cornwall earlier today. This is Perrinporth Beach, huge expansive sands, nice little bit of breeze, nice bit of surf for those lessons going on there as well, and plenty of people out enjoying the weather. You can see some decent sunshine lighting up the golden sands, bit of a breeze and some far reaching views, just a little bit of cloud overhead. Almost the ideal conditions you could think of for a day in mid-April. But it depended where you were, because in Tynmouth, 
Well, it couldn't have been more different, really. Thick mist and fog obscuring the views and what is otherwise a really nice rugged coastline on that part of South Devon. Kept temperatures down as well. It was quite chilly because of a lack of sunshine. It's difficult to see really where well, where the sea ends and where the sky begins. So huge contrast, we'll see perhaps a little bit more of that. But it is generally warm for those of you particularly in land. For the next few days, we've got temperatures at least in the mid to high teens as we head through the next few days, but bit by bit, some colder air is just gonna start to work its way through. And as we head towards Easter Monday, we're gonna see just a little bit of a breakdown in otherwise some fine weather. Feels like home. Whatever the weather. Valent Boilers and Heat Pumps. Sponsors ITV West Country Weather. The Easter weekend then. Not looking too bad. A long bank holiday. Three out of four days look fairly decent with some largely dry weather. Some more warmth to that as well. And a little bit of sunshine breaking through. Don't expect clear blue skies. It's Easter Monday. We see a bit more of a change. Some colder air. A couple of showers working through. Probably some stronger winds as well. But before then, high pressure is with us and it's here to stay. Not slap bang overhead, but close enough to give us a good deal of settled weather for the next few days. Light winds, not much rainfall, and yes, not huge amounts of sunshine, but it's relatively fair. As for the rest of tonight, well, there's some late sunshine. It will stay pretty dry as we head through the night time, but again, we'll see the cloud bases lower and we'll see some more mist and fog developing out across the Scillies in the west of Cornwall. There might be a bit of dampness rolling in as well before the night is out, but it will be mild. Most places staying in double figures, I would have thought. Maybe some clearer skies further east might just dip down to seven or eight Celsius. And Good Friday for most places will be a fine and dry day eventually. The murky start across parts of Devon and Cornwall eventually will turn a bit brighter. Inland, I think we'll see quite a bit of sunshine, but we may well hold on to a little bit of sea mist and fog again around some of the coastlines. But uh, yeah, it will be quite warm in the sunshine inland. 17 Celsius across parts of Somerset, but I think elsewhere some cloudy skies might just drag those temperatures down ever so slightly. High tide tomorrow, St Mary's there, half four in the morning and around 10 to 5 in the evening. And as we head through the rest of the weekend, well Saturday and Sunday are pretty fine really. Mid-teens, a lot of dry weather, a bit of sunshine pushing through. It's Easter Monday, we see that change with a few more showers and those temperatures much nearer to normal. So if you need a reminder of what the sun looks like, take this picture that Nicholas sent. And this is the lighthouse all the way down on the Lizard. Valent. Sponsors ITV West Country Weather. Charlie, thank you. Have a good Easter weekend, won't you? Uh, just before we leave you this evening, we need to say goodbye to someone. Carly, you're off. I am, yeah, in case you've noticed. <laughs> uh, I've got a good reason to have a bit of time off. So, yeah, I will miss it, but I'll be back. Um, and just thank you to everyone who sent me some lovely gifts for the baby. So, yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to miss you, but you will be back very soon. We'll look out for some breaking news in the next <laughs> few weeks. That's it from all of us. I've got the late news at half ten. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>